as uh, the is going to be very technical. I think it's probably going to be less technical than here, but we promise to be a little more deeper than swarm. Um, okay, so. mm -hmm. All right. So the topic we're going to present today is the crypto economic DAO. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of DAO or decentralized autonomous corporation. Great. Um, so I think we specifically use the word crypto economic just to be very specific that it's not necessarily just a pure decentralized application, but more it has a crypto economic layer. Um, and I think it's going to be more, hopefully this discussion will be more interactive, that you know you could feel free to chime in with any questions. Mm -hmm. A little bit of introduction of myself. I'm a founder with uh, Quantify. Uh, we specifically focus on being a crypto funding platform for decentralized applications. So we go out the world to find projects that we feel are exciting, decentralized you know, application, uh, rather than the engineer crowdfunding platform. Uh, I had a background in CS, MBA, um, and then also worked for eBay for a while. Uh, my specific personal interest is kind of the intersection between philosophy, economics, engineering, but gladly crypto I think satisfy all three different stuff. Um, all right, so let's get into the DAP stuff. Maybe a little bit of quiz for all of you. What do you think, like looking at these lists of stuff, we are in Ethereum, uh, Ethereum based smart contracts, file coin gems, you know, which one think you think are dApps and which are not? Anyone think uh, BitTorrent is a type of application? Are we giving out free yes. gems? Yes. 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 Okay. Any different answers? Any different talks? Only the Ethereum smart contract. And not yet, because it's not right. <laughs> yes. Well, we've got customers. Yeah. Works on cat for you. Okay, cool. So, um, so I'll probably try to get, I think there's so many different ways, different terminologies. I would probably try to put um, my own little definition around what we think are the decentralized attributes that we're looking after and why crypto economics is a key part of that. Um, so if you look at decentralized application, I think from that term, you could consider Vitorin really being a decentralized application itself. They have decentralized nodes, and they talk to each other, exchange data. Uh, the only thing is, all of these nodes tend to be a barter based economy, right? So if you give me one gigabyte of data, I'll feed you back that data, right? It's a barter economy. There's no um, you know, currency economy in that sense. So I think the way we kind of dis, um, define crypto economy data is you actually have a currency layer. So instead of it being barter, which require a simultaneous uh, meeting of you know, needs, of the mutual needs, now you could actually have a you know, data system, a ledger system, as well as what? then you can redeem it later on. Mm -hmm. so that's the kind of definition that we're going after. And that's, I think, the exciting kind of breakthrough for, for um, the after Bitcoin. <laughs> so just using an example of Filecoin, yeah, um, I guess, are you guys familiar with Filecoin? Basically, it's kind of like storage a made safe in solving the file distribute file system problem, and basically have a coin that you know, register uh, all the credits that people uh, consume or provide in the storage space. Um, now, what's interesting is, let's try to put a kind of definition, a more rigid definition around what exactly is crypto economy. Yeah. The way we define that is it's a crypto economy based, it's a distributed application, uh, and with support, it's usually from the human uh, participants, it's usually become really powerful, that usually replaces a company, traditional company, or a service provider in that sense. Um, you could consider something like Napster as having crypto economy, and it basically kills an industry, a trying to kill an industry. Uh, that. Uh, there's three, I think, important characteristics of these common apps. One, first of all, it has a cold part, but it also has a human involvement. So when we say a decentralized autonomous corporation, it doesn't mean it's, it has no human part. It actually can have a human part, and usually it's an integral part of that. The second part is it has a transparent business model. And I think that's what Bitcoin really pioneers, is you know it's economic distribution, you know how it generates currency, how it works people. And the third part is usually it has some kind of communal ownership. Instead of being a private company that you know, a group of small people owns it, now you have kind of more open ownerships. Um, so that's kind of the definition I would probably put around you know, as a context for this whole discussion. Um, any questions so far? So just to make it a little more interesting, let's introduce a few more other concepts you probably heard pretty, um, I hear some, some answers around smart contracts. But so what exactly is the difference between a smart contract versus a DAC and versus smart corporation? Um, so let's try to look at four different dimensions. First one is dynamic membership. Uh, any of you who read the sidechain paper are probably familiar with this concept, right? They define Bitcoin as a dynamic membership-based um, you know, uh, kind of ledger system. Dynamic membership basically means it's an open-ended. Anyone can join, anyone can leave. Like any Bitcoin miners can do that. Um, the second part of that is autonomous you know, 
So let's actually look at you know, these four examples. The one that failed this test, if I had membership, is probably smart contract. When I say I create a smart contract, let's say we have a derivative contract, a contract differences. Usually one end is usually decided. So if I enter a futures contract against my counterparty, uh, you know, let's see if there's a fixed supply. But unlike, let's say, a decentralized exchange in a decentralized corporation, you could have unlimited participants and unknown participants uh, at all. What does it mean, autonomous decision rules, really? I think it's an interesting question. I, I think it has, um, the way I kind of look at it, it's usually that the deck itself can make a decision, not necessarily without external inputs, but at least with a fixed business rule that is deterministic. So you can sort of predict with that input, you can always. Versus the counter example is you have a lot of human involvement. Let's say the nulls are completely designed in a way that everybody would vote. The primary decision power comes from human. Then you probably would not consider that autonomous. Does that make sense? No, because I still don't know what autonomous means. Autonomous must mean on its own. It makes decision on its own. But it makes yes. rules on its own, or humans make the rules? Well, I guess, you know, in the currency without the full AI, you obviously have to human. So once it enters into production, it's supposedly to be made on its own. Okay. With external potential input of oracles and all that. Um, so yeah. So what, what, did you say oracle? Yeah. What's an oracle? No, I mean they could have take external data inputs. Okay. Right. Like, you know, if this sporting bet failed as a result, then yes, distribute. But that's still deterministic. As long as the input is known. Um, so in that case, I think, you know, smart corporation is another concept. Is what if you put a company, a traditional company, but record it on the blockchain? Uh, it's still largely run by humans, so it would fail the autonomous test. Uh, or the all, I, I think, matters. Uh, the third dimension is tokenized economy. And I think that's one of the major differences that we just talked about. Is if you look at something like BitTorrents, uh, yes, it has all this economy barter base, but it doesn't really have an internal capital. It allows exchange capital between different parties. So I think that's an important dimension. And the very last one is something that I don't think we talk enough about, but I think it's very exciting, is the idea of self. Right? I think if you think about it, um, the, the one key difference is our symbol of a higher well, animal is probably you know, has a self-consciousness of the aware of being itself. And so far, most of the DAOs or DAC that we've seen so far doesn't really have this concept of self. Yes, it redistributes, let's say you have a derivative contract, swipe contract, uh, it redistributes profits or tokens between different parties, but it doesn't have the idea of itself. It's talking to external parties. So I think this is an um, interesting area that we can look at. Um, so if you look at, you know, class distributed app, there's no self, smart contract, no self. DAO could have, uh, so I put a yellow one there because it could have, but it's not a necessary condition. Um, but it could have, and obviously it's more corporation because it's a corporation entity, it's like a separate legal personality, you could have the uh, self. Uh, to, to make a more concrete example, imagine, let's say, um, you create a DAC, uh, where everybody, let's say, decentralized health insurance. Um, on top of the health insurance that it pulls together all the funds together, redistributes profits to um, payouts, you could also, let's say, reinvest 1% of its profit out of the DAO um, and into the US dollar of both markets. Right? That's something that actually retains certain capital. So it has this like, um, self-contained capital. I think that would be one example of what it possibly do um, instead of actually measuring all the So that's kind of my attempt trying to clarify some of the you know, different concepts. I have a question on the term tokenized economy. I haven't really been following what's been going on the last half year in, the, in this space, but um, I'm, I'm like an old school financial <coughs> guy, and token means, I think, something completely different as what it has come to it means right now. So when you say tokenized economy, what, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's really means something that, uh, yeah, I'm trying to struggle to find the right word, but I, I used to call it internal power or something that is basically an instrument or a token that represents a certain economic resource that it can natively decide on blockchain, right? The word you're looking for is a security. <laughs> yes, I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not necessarily security on this one, right? When you create a virtual property, let's say a domain name or something, it could be you know, okay. anything. But something that it can move within the blockchain. We used to call it the... Well, old school guys in this place. We used to call it digital assets. Could be. So, but, uh, well, I guess the digital assets are kind of, I don't know. Some well, something based, based, something which retains value, the classification of right. something or other. Where a token means something completely different in crypto, okay. which is why I find it really weird how all of a sudden it's meant. Like, yeah. I don't know who started it and why it was started. It should be 
Probably just was the S word. We used token because we didn't want to say security. Yes. And we needed to use a word we wouldn't get the SEC on us. So token is our new word. I love taking token. Yeah. But I guess it is that we want to take the word. But well, it's okay to make something that's different, which is why I just don't understand. It does make something, I think, more broad than the European Union. The token itself, uh, the tokenizing economy, it represents some value in the economy of Jamaica. While the security is a contract to a value that resides elsewhere and it's a promise to pay that, that, that is not what, that, what this is. It's not a promise. You actually hold a, a thing inside the application that can be used within the application for whatever purpose you can design for. And it is a uniform resource of sorts. So it is, it is just a, a representative of something that the application can offer. It's not, it's not something that will guarantee you any kind of return, any kind of profit, or any kind of money. So, so that you can output on the blockchain is a token. It could be a token. So, okay. yeah. Well, to be real precise, I think we can classify them into two big buckets. One is internal tokens or internal representations, which is basically their own value by itself. Bitcoin is in the tip of the capital. And the other side is like IOUs. Basically, it's maps to an external economic resource, which can be a security, can be an asset, can be a goal, whatever that is. So uh, I think that would be So yeah, uh, so that's kind of the difference we we'll look at. It. And probably today's discussion will specifically focus on the third category, which is the DAC and DO, and what I'm personally really excited about. Um, so uh, look at so let's talk about what exactly can DAPs do. Um, we try to, uh, we've seen, seen quite a bit of DAP projects coming in uh, last, since last year. Um, I think trying to classify them into the different buckets. The first big bucket, which you see probably the most projects and the most exciting and immediate use case, is computational services. The great thing about computational services is they're all verifiable, they're very they're commoditized, they're very easy to exchange, and they're usually internalized in somewhere. And you know, you could look at block category of storage, obviously. And then I'll just put an extra category for immutable storage given blockchain unique property. You know, you could have something like moderate, all that stuff that is really possible for. Uh, the second you have computation, and you can talk about general, generic computation, uh, basic computation, hashing, or something very specific, like you want to do jobs. So you can outsource a bunch of to do jobs to thousand nodes instead of going to AWS to run that job. Uh, you could have some bandwidth, you know, some like for open for doing. Instead of someone relaying your, your traffic in order to help you get Facebook in China, uh, you can now you know, pay someone basically anonymously using the token economy to shoot them. Uh, the last category I haven't seen much, but I think it's something really interesting is, is Internet of Things. So start imagining you know you have a sensor sensor network that actually you know collects data for you, but with certain conditions. That's collecting all the traffic data, collecting you know whatever uh, your room temperature data and all that stuff that connect that. So that's a big category of computational service. Uh, the second one, I think, is research distribution. Um, so that's a very broad category. And usually, and I think that's a reason why, if you look at the 2.0 space, most of the projects tend to start with financial ones. Uh, because the thing is, you're all, all you're manipulating is just capital. You're redistributing capital between different parties, right? So you look at things like insurance, um, decentralized exchange, lottery, prediction markets, lending services, all very financial, but all they're doing is really manipulating and moving uh, tokens around. These tokens can be either used to an external you know, commodity, hard assets, but it also could be some internal capital token of value. It could be an Ethereum token, Ethereum, it could be Bitcoin, whatever that is. Um, and the good thing is, you know, they're enforceable, uh, they're self enforceable. Uh, then you have other types of things like digital property, which not necessarily is a specific financial asset. But it could be a domain name, it could be a copyright, whatever that is. Um, third part, I think very underdeveloped right now, is human services. And I think there's a good reason for why it's underdeveloped at this stage. It's just because it's hard to verify. Um, but it's something that can be very exciting. And these, I think, go hands in hand with the development of the whole sharing economy. Like look at Airbnb, look at what Uber is doing. Uh, they can be a very interesting use case. But just a little harder to verify whether someone really you know, drives you from San Francisco to San Francisco. Right? It's just hard, hard to verify the nature of watching operation. But I think it will get there. Uh, the one that I think I haven't seen any so far is large-scale collaborations. When you look at traditional company, um, it's fairly easy to decentralize or debt by a peer-to-peer -peer type of company. So if you have you're a bunch of lawyers who are mostly individual contributors, sure, you can decentralize it. And everyone is paid based on their contribution. That's relatively easy to do. But if you're trying to, let's say, decentralize Google, you know, how do you do that? How do you get 100 people to collaborate at a different level, still decentralized? They're almost by nature, you know, kind of central. But I think that's something kind of interesting, 
how do you use blockchain as a way to organize people for more complicated um, um, kind of organization, coordination problems? And that's something I think uh, we touch base a little bit on that is something potentially a new management structure, something like let's say you know futarchy or um, um, holacracy. Are you guys familiar with the concept of holacracy? It's basically a very flat management structure instead of you having top down CEO type management structure. Like for example, the large company I think did so far is Apple's, which is like three thousand five thousand people company. Right? All the top instead of having you know all the way from Tony Shea down to the, to the lowest level employee, now you have four hundred different circles. You have different circles. Each circle would rule all their own function, and it's a rough, largely you know flat organization with no manager no supervisor. So these kind of new managerial you know pattern paradigm can also apply to something. Um, Decentralization, which is really exciting. Um, so these, I think, would be three categorization. Um, please tell me if I'm missing anything in big buckets here. Isn't um, that, should we call that that experiments? Because none of those services really seem like they're surviving. Sir, what's that? Aren't they just experiments versus services? I, none of these things you've listed here seem to be either things that are either sustainable or have found a way to actually map either the investment of time or the experiments into something that is more lasting than sustainable. I'm probably a bit more optimistic. And maybe an example of a sustainable track. Um, well, actually, I was trying to map all these, you know, the existing ones. So if you look at computational service, you know, you have a bunch of like StoreJ, Filecoin, DNA coin, for example, very special. Are you calling StoreJ an example of a sustainable service? Uh, why is that? Why is it not sustainable? sustainable? Something that, you know, we, when we leave here tonight, we're all going to say, great, we're going to create data services at work, we're going to build stuff. What are we going to build at work? It's just really early. I would so it's an experiment. Yeah, could be. Okay. So that's not that specific. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the way to look at it, like, I think we're looking at services that has the potential to be to be done. I love it. I love potential. Yeah. But is there anything there that, on this list, that you look at and you say, of all that are listed, this has the best potential to survive? Better on anything specific. I would really look at a fundamental property or even from first principle, what makes sense to be gamified. And I think right now it seems to me at least, you know, the computational service and research distribution to the easiest human part a lot harder. Uh, we probably just need better ways to measure for human performance. Right? Is there one happen. example of these things that have done well that you say we should look at and say, let's study this further when you guys need your time? Um, let me ask you another way. Yeah. If you're sitting here as a developer trying to figure out I want to do something. What's, what's the biggest market opportunity to chase out? I would say, I, I think definitely computation research by itself. Like, it's just the industry the storage market, right? It's like $100 plus yeah. markets below. So I think it, any one of them can be huge. Uh, but then, depending on what you look at, if you look at, let's say, market capitalization or the potential you as a developer to be compensated by, you know, or creating an impact, I think definitely computation research is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you talk about resource distribution, you know, that's more of the financial side. Uh, the, the harder part, I think, with resource distribution is right now you don't have a lot of tokenized world. For example, you know, if you want to do a, a <coughs> derivative, you probably just don't have that in the Yes, that's probably a little bit challenge. Um, human part is, is, is much harder. So the Internet of Things sets that pretty big. Yes. Uh -huh. I agree. How about energy production? Also, can you give me one concrete example? I don't know. Uh, if you could probably, I mean, I don't know if this is going to be done, but if you could prove cryptographically that a, a solar panel, uh, maybe it's a specific brand of solar panel, but this particular solar panel uh, produced this much electricity, then you have a, essentially a proof of work just based on the production of energy rather than the destruction of energy. Yeah. Yeah. Possible. Uh, maybe. Very possible. I think it also depends on like whether it's an economy of scale. Like if it's something of the economy of scale, very likely it's going to be centralized, or it makes more sense to centralize. Uh, like in solar case, I'm, I'm not I'm not too familiar with that. Like how much of efficiency difference we're talking about in kind of power plants versus you know individuals. Well, I don't think it really matters at that point because you have it collectively, right? So yes, it might be less efficient, but you have it spread out, and distributed around the world, and you're creating incentive systems for the entire world participants. Possible, especially if it's existing infrastructure. Like for example, I think using the example of storage. Um, you obviously are less efficient, cost efficient in the individual personal storage market, but because it's like Airbnb, it's you know, wasted storage anyway. So I think you have to kind of gain on that and that one. So maybe energy would work that like well, I don't have enough. On the previous slide, you had an um, academic having to do with services. What was that stand for? Uh, IOP? The Internet of Things. Oh, yes, yeah, so sensors and all. Uh, 
connect to the Grill Net, <coughs> uh, I think, was one project on that. I think that was like a Todd's Grill Net we were trying to do this kind of thing. That was interesting. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, so let's say you know, you're a developer and you have found something interesting that you think can make sense to be gamified. So let's look at at a very high level what exactly makes, uh, what are the factors that you need to think about uh, as a business. Yeah. Uh, the first thing you probably started with is the service layer. What exactly the services uh, you're trying to do? And the first thing you want to decide about is who are the actors and roles that they play. Uh, in the big one world, you have migrants, you have users. You know, and in another, let's say, Lazus, which is a decentralized region, you have people who are actually driving, you have a streamer, you might have a uh, couple different roles. Uh, the second thing you want to come up with is like, what is the proof of X here? Uh, how do you prove someone actually drove you? How do you prove that health care insurance should be paid out? Um, which sometimes you need articles and you know, different smart contract system. which I think is great when you have something like uh, counterparties, uh, is very plug, which is probably good for exactly this. Um, and then you obviously need a mutable ledger that actually records down every time. Uh, you have room for it. So that's probably the service layer that you have to consider as an application. Um, second layer is the economy. So you have a, you probably design your own infrastructure, and uh, you have a ledger. Uh, you have a reward scheme, and you should issue funding. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the economic layer, depending uh, on that a little bit. Uh, the final layer is something uh, we're we'll talking about is the self. Is that whether that DAC has the idea of its kind of self consciousness, which is what it does have the trade system that allows for some level of self modification. Uh, for example, Bitcoin for obviously you just deploy new version of minor to vote uh, with modification. But there could be other ways of doing that. Um, and then you also, something that I haven't seen much is the interdaps. Like, how does one, for example, store J DAC talk to, let's say, a Captain DAC? a mobile sensor network, or whatever that is. Uh, so that's the other part. Uh, it could also, a DAC today could also you know, interact with it through API. Let's say a DAC want to pay for its own posting costs in AWS. Oh. They could take a transaction fee and, and put these posting costs in back to AWS to pay for itself. Uh, you could have different kind of interactions. So we like to take a very high level layer trying to lay out you know, the, the factor that you would want to consider. Uh, what consensus system you want to use, what letter you want to choose, what kind of token you kind of use. Uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, I'm trying to expand a little bit more on the economic part. 